everyone. And uh, welcome to the second session of the Industry and Government Invited Talks. Uh, we have uh, three more speakers, uh, fantastic talks lined up for you. Uh, first up, we have Chris White. Uh, until recently, he was program manager at DARPA, where he led some of the biggest open data initiatives, including XData, Memex, Open Catalog, and this was part of the president's uh, big data initiative. Uh, the work that he has done at DARPA has been applied uh, quite extensively to things like human trafficking and counterterrorism efforts. Very recently, uh, Chris has been recruited by Microsoft, where he's working on a variety of special projects. Uh, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Chris White. Thanks. Uh, so as uh, it was mentioned, I was at DARPA before uh, a couple of months ago and recently joined Microsoft. And I thought uh, this was maybe a thing I shouldn't come do. But when uh, uh, Usama and, and Rajesh reached out to me, they explained that no, actually moving from the government into the industry to discuss issues that are common to both uh, is an important topic for the audience. And so in fact, the fact that there's this transition is a, is a valuable uh, thing to talk about. So mostly, Mostly what I'll do is explain things that I think would be painfully for you to learn on your own. And uh, instead, hopefully, you can learn about them from, from my experience and uh, apply those that are relevant to you. And, and I start with this, uh, you know, this picture of the internet, which for those that can't read on the back, it says, on the internet, uh, nobody knows you're a dog. Uh, I thought this was like, kind of funny, but actually it's not true anymore. I'm sure if you went to a lot of the other sessions this, this week, you'll actually, you, you know that people can really tell who you are really easily, more or less, right? And so actually, if this is true, it's more like, if you're running Tor, then, then maybe the internet doesn't know that you're a dog. Uh, but I importantly here is, is this, this disconnection between how people think uh, information is processing, you know, is happening on the web, and then the ways in which we can sort of view technology to take advantage of it. So I'll use search and, and, and sort of web applications as a main, main driver throughout the talk. But, but first, a little context for, for myself and about DARPA for those that are, are less familiar. Uh, whenever I get confused about, about DARPA, I would go to the, the mission statement. Uh, because that's a great place to know kind of whether your azimuth is, is sort of correct. And, and DARPA has two missions. One was to, to create and prevent technological surprise. And the other is to create uh, ubiquitous technology. And so my sort of goal as a, as a person designing uh, major investments and articulating the feedback to get those investments to build software useful for us was to make sure that we were doing one of those two things. And, and for me, it ended up being a little bit more on the bottom part. Uh, that's what I'll talk about sort of open technology and open software. Uh, but the, the bottom part ends up helping the top part turns out. And so DARPA is actually relatively flat. Uh, there are about seven offices. It's only about 100 people. I was in the, the software office. It was in charge of big data and, and cyber, things like malware, uh, as well as things like uh, you know, machine learning. And uh, you know, wherever you are depends, of course, on where you, where you sit. And so, so if you're a satellite, uh, this is what DARPA looks like. Uh, it's the small box right here. Uh, over here is Washington, uh, Washington DC. And uh, if you were in a simulation, uh, DARPA looks like this. Uh, it's the red, the red building. Um, are any of you in a simulation? Yeah. How, how would you know? Yeah. yeah. You think about it, really, seriously. Um, and uh, DARPA is known uh, sort of through this uh, sort of special forces of innovation. Uh, for those that would like to read more, this is an article written a couple of years ago by the DARPA director, Regina Dugan, who's now uh, at Google, and uh, uh, Ken Gabriel, who's now at, at Draper, and it talks about some of the aspects of what it takes to, to innovate over a long time period. And by innovating, that means every five to 10 years, creating something which is used by everyone, things like GPS, the internet, uh, stealth, uh, UAVs, things that impact everyone. And so it's a great way to kind of see more, but I guess really I put this up there because it makes me, I guess, a, a member of the, of the special forces, forces uh, which became more, more true than I really wanted it to be, actually. Uh, and so for, for me, it started in the, in the lab. Uh, this is uh, the Maxwell Dworkin building at, at Harvard, which is quite, quite nice. Uh, sort of co-authored and interned with you know, Google and IBM and, and Microsoft. Uh, kind of the, the KD-like like community of people. Uh, but, but that's kind of where the similarity ended. I took this sort of major detour into the special forces, which turns out sent me li literally to, to war. Um, and so if going back here, this, this was my sort of like work building. And uh, then this was my, my new work building. Right? This, is ra this is razor wire. And in fact, this building is like inside of a compound, inside of a compound, inside of a base. 
right? And so it's the, there's a joint intelligence operations center. And uh, there's some nice pictures of me looking kind of serious because it was a little bit serious and wearing things that uh, protect you from things getting, you know, getting shot. And uh, you know, this is again to provide some of the context for what it means for me to do field work and for what it means to work with users. Uh, there was a comment in the earlier session about the risks of losing, you know, uh, you know, click-through ads versus, um, you know, financial transactions. Well, the, the impacts here are a little bit different too, right? Uh, the cost of a false alarm and a miss are substantially, um, you know, different than in Allen advertising. Uh, but so this is where I worked. Uh, this was my uh, commute to work. Uh, uh, this is me in the first helicopter. Uh, you always fly in two of them. Those are Blackhawks in case one of them gets shot down. Uh, this is the Queen's Palace outside of Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, it was destroyed in the late 70s when the Russians invaded. And uh, you know, it looks a little bit sort of desertish and, 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 and barren. It's a, actually a beautiful place. But uh, you know, I'm landing here you know, for, for work coming you know, relatively um, recently out of the academic space where I was writing papers and uh, presenting at conferences like this. And, and I land uh, in this desert looking kind of place and lo and behold, it was like full of data. Yeah, it, turns, it turns out that even when there's like nothing else going on, there's like a lot of data. Uh, but thankfully, uh, you know, I remembered my training uh, from, from DARPA and it turns out that we did some sort of useful things, right? Uh, and, and some of that was written up in this nice award that we were given by the Secretary of Defense on the anniversary of the 9-11 bombings, talking about basically not being content to stand you know, in the lab and instead getting out and dealing with the constraints and the realities that come from uh, deploying you know, software into real environments, and particularly in this case, environments that have exigent circumstances. But you know, it was really nice, led, led sort of some meetings in the White House. This is the Ro Roosevelt Room. And uh, you know, I was in a meeting in this room with uh, sort of principals and, and that meant like head of uh, NIH and, and, and NASA and, and, and DOE and veterans. And they were all going around the room uh, talking a lot about what some of the talks early in the, in the, in the session were talking about. Uh, data issues around scalability, streaming, uh, budgets, uh, existing software legacy systems, um, lack of research, uh, changing environment, all the, the Vs associated with data. And, uh, and, and it really bothered me because I saw in the field many of the same problems that I was turning to our toolkit that had been you know, sort of part of the community and it really wasn't very sufficient. Uh, and so there were a variety of lessons that were learned kind of from all this, all this field work. Uh, the, the first one was, uh, you know, one was like setting goals that were connecting our research efforts into, uh, I'll call them business processes here, but really they're um, sort of the constraints of reality. And, and for example, uh, developing analytics with performance guarantees in realistic settings. It sounds kind of generic, but uh, it turns out realistic settings is a really important thing for applications, and uh, performance guarantee is a really important thing for theoretical uh, computer science. And so being able to kind of bridge, uh, you know, computer science areas with application areas was, was really important. Or, or de designing interfaces for lots of groups. That was, that was very important too. Uh, the second one was, was maybe the most important lesson learned out of all of the field work, which was that minimizing design to testing time allowed for a birth of new ideas uh, of, of successes and, and failures uh, that would not have been possible under traditional software lifecycle you know, patterns. Um, and, and in fact, uh, the use of open source software is sort of fundamental to enabling this, in my opinion, because of the ease of connecting components and the ability to rapidly uh, kind of build uh, vertical systems from lots of uh, smaller pieces. And, and sort of third was developing with you know, users in the loop. And, and this is kind of talked about a lot now lately, but really this is uh, as a fundamental process of developing software, uh, having people doing the testing and evaluation that will eventually lead to transition and adoption into an enterprise. Uh, it's a really important process for getting buy-in, uh, for understanding the difference in populations, uh, and for uh, really, really understanding the application. Uh, it turns out that people uh, that are really smart in computer science are not really smart in other things. It was really is surprising to most people, actually. You know, it, but anybody who's spent time at a really good school, like uh, a really top tier school knows this is true, that just because you're good at taking tests doesn't generally mean that you're a good person uh, or that you know the socially appropriate thing to say. It turns out that we have a really hard time forecasting what people will use and why they will use it and under what circumstances they will use it. So it turns out it's easier just to put it in their hands and see what they do and passively observe them, use that as a process for doing a kind of A-B testing that we heard about you know, earlier from, from George. Uh, and then importantly, kind of to uh, uh, Usama and uh, Basil's point, uh, enabling sort of full stack open source software integration was absolutely necessary in order to do anything that was different. If what you want to do is very uh, common uh, and very well defined, uh, then you can probably buy very good software for it. 
Uh, but if you want to experiment into new applications, uh, new analytics, uh, new interfaces, uh, new distributed systems, it turns out that building blocks coming from existing repositories are, are absolutely necessary, in my opinion. And so uh, after all the field work, uh, we kind of uh, you know, uh, came back, and, and, and as, as uh, uh, just mentioned, there was this um, sort of big, big investment into uh, data science out of the White House. Uh, the X Data program that I created and ran was part of that. And it was part of a larger set of issues as well. And, and that was, you know, this is in 2012. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, and, and some of those investments are, are starting to pay off. And I really, again, mention this only to provide kind of the context for what it means from taking kind of the constraints of, of field testing and, and sort of innovating into new application areas and then building larger, more well-defined systems that can be used by uh, a, a broader set of people in a more reusable form, right? And, and that ended up actually working pretty well for us. We, we picked a problem uh, that we cared about in the anti-human trafficking space and sort of invested in technologies that were supporting uh, the infrastructure necessary to solve those problems, things like databases, machine learning, interfaces. And, and the results were, were, were quite positive. This was a nice article in the Wall Street Journal uh, that maybe somebody at Microsoft saw before they tried to hire me, saying something is better than Google. Um, and then this was a nice uh, thing in 60 Minutes. But uh, you know, really what, what, this, what this showed to me uh, was that uh, it was a, there was a hard time addressing many of the important problems uh, like in the law enforcement community, intelligence community, and that the existing for purchase software weren't, weren't getting the job done. And so we needed instead just kind of build, build into new, new directions. And, and a, an important part of building that new direction was to make it uh, freely available. And so here are some uh, articles that talking about the, the, the open catalog, which, which were just mentioned earlier. And, and this was very, very important. The open catalog, if you go to it now, has something like uh, 23, 24 DARPA programs and something like 20,000 artifacts, including uh, Git repos, uh, publications, uh, documentation. Uh, and until this had happened, uh, there was no you know, sort of coordination, there was no emphasis on reusability, on transparency and benchmarking, on accountability for uh, investments and, and this kind of thing. And for me, as kind of a, a you know, uh, taxpayer, I felt a sort of a philosophy of governance that if there wasn't a compelling security reason to keep something secret, that we should make it free and easy to access. And so uh, some of those projects have, have become extremely successful. Like for example, uh, uh, you know, sort of Databricks uh, commercializing uh, Apache Spark, which before that was just uh, Spark and was a, a low-level Spark project. Uh, you know, working with the AMP Lab, able to you know promote this into a top-level Apache project, and then you know they sort of launched this company and doing really great things in the, in the Spark you know community. Uh, you know, and if you sort of browse the catalog, you'll see a lot of the the usual suspects where the emphasis was on you know reusable software. So universities that would put out code that wasn't terrible, and companies that were willing to test in new directions, right? And uh, to give you sort of a, a deeper example, um, I will uh, kind of go into a sort of a case study around uh, human trafficking. I'll show you a couple of slides, but then really I'll, I'll sort of demo some things so you can see uh, more clearly what I'm talking about and, and why I think that uh, at Microsoft and, and companies like Microsoft, there's a good opportunity to capitalize on, on the momentum around analytics, machine learning, and open source software. So uh, this is a picture of a guy on an airplane uh, with a lot of file folders. <coughs> Uh, any any guess on when this picture was like taken? Yeah, like it looks like maybe a long time ago, right? But this was like a month ago. This was a guy sitting two seats down uh, from a colleague of mine uh, who has a stack of papers and a highlighter in his mouth and a pen and uh, some notes. Uh, and you know, we're better than this now generally in big companies, but uh, this process of uh, sort of uh, serially uh, and manually reviewing information. Uh, to synthesize uh, a new work product is the thing which is still happening kind of everywhere, and I'll give more examples of this. But in, in the human trafficking space, imagine this guy is a, a, an investigator in an anti-human trafficking case in, in New York. We worked with uh, the district attorney of New York, and I'm sure many of you have seen like Law and Order, uh, Law and Order SVU, maybe? Yeah, you watch TV? No? Is it on Hulu? Or, or, no? Right, well, there is a show called Law and Order. It's the most successful, <laughs> longest running television show in the history of television shows. Law and Order SVU has been around for 16 years. Uh, it's like quite remarkable, just from a television standpoint. Uh, nevertheless, this place, the New York DA's office, has a Special Victims Bureau where they prosecute anti-human trafficking cases. And one of their jobs is to understand the relationship between charges and suspects and the online advertising for sex and related services. And what that means practically, they have a team of like five data scientists whose job it is to go do this kind of a thing online, Googling uh, and binging uh, ads for sex to see the connections between them and understand the state of a situation. So what does that look like? 
it looks really manual. Uh, so, so often, you know, they get a tip uh, either from a hotline or often from a, a, a sort of related domestic violence case or something else. That leads to, you know, things like Salesforce and databases that they maintain records in, and you get then sort of candidates for like uh, addresses or suspects that might be in a case. And then, and then this process happens over and over again, where, where, I mean, how many of you have opened up more than 20 browser tabs at the same time? 20, right? All of you, 20, easily, right. How many separate windows with 20 browser tabs? I'm guessing five, <laughs> right? Right, I mean, like, I was looking over the shoulder for some people earlier, like, you know, iTerm, many, many browser tabs. <clears throat> so uh, this, this process of, of many browser tabs, many different websites, uh, iterating back and forth between different key terms, you're having to, like, guess the right English or, like, language text combinations of terms to get the magic, you know, results that you need to have come up. Uh, you maybe have internal databases, you have things like phone numbers and, and images, and, and you're doing a lot of depth maybe on, on a single site. And in this process, uh, over and over again, is how people use the information, you know, use the internet uh, to do sort of like investigative searches. And so, uh, you know, what I'll well, introduce is this notion of, of, of a perfect session, right? So, so down here, it's kind of hard to read, but without time constraints, what would a per how many search queries would be in a perfect session? Right, for that guy and for this anti-human trafficking caseworker, that would mean opening, uh, say, order a thousand documents and reading every word, uh, understanding the right combinations of words to extract and, and, and query into commercial search engines and APIs, and then the iteration and manual aggregation and filtering of those, of those results. And, and that, that, that would probably, you know, for a single session, a single person, you know, for a case like this, uh, order 3,000 queries, something like this. And, and that's just not feasible given the way the search engines are designed uh, with the kind of one size fits all where you have a text box, uh, whether you're buying birthday presents or whether you're looking for victims, right? So different, very different tasks, same interface. And, and there's a question as to like why, why that's the case and what maybe we can do about it. Uh, a sort of generalization of this uh, process, which I saw kind of everywhere, was this uh, sort of meandering process of, of investigative use of search engines. And it was like you start by yourself, usually you have to have the right text. Uh, you're like spending time reading pages, you eventually find a number you want. You kind of meander around the web uh, looking for a combination of things that you maybe care about. And then in the end, you sort of like aggregate them by yourself and you get like a PowerPoint presentation. Right? Uh, this is how like a lot of research is done uh, these days, uh, especially for um, organizations that have uh, business processes that involve the, the internet, like uh, law enforcement, advertising, marketing. And, and sort of a, yet another abstraction of this uh, is the sort of workflow idea of, of data processing in general, which is, is, is one that I can kind of show, show like this, where you have data sources on the left-hand side, they go through platforms, analytics, visualization, interaction, and there's queries on the right-hand side, and you have sort of workflow management. I, I put this here for two reasons. And the first one is that if all of them that I saw earlier today and so far are like software stacks, where you have you know, database layers, application layers, uh, very rarely do I see a person in them, hardly ever. Maybe a stick figure with like a little eyeball or something, right? Uh, in this view, uh, a third of the workflow involves people, involves uh, visualization, interaction, and a specification of workflows and queries, right? So, so for me, one of the lessons I learned going into the field, I went there to go find out where IEDs were gonna go off, to, to detect where uh, roads were vulnerable, and I thought it was gonna be a math problem, and it turned out to be a visualization problem because most of the people that care about important things um, are not technical, it turns out. Uh, they need to understand uh, provenance, uh, reliability, repeatability. They need to understand uh, facets and, and the complete picture. And so giving them the output of a model uh, tends to be unsatisfactory to a lot of their, um, you know, sort of making sense of the decision-making process, right? And so it turns out that this, especially as the data get bigger and more complicated, and as you fuse more kinds and types together, it becomes even more important to enable people uh, to rapidly interact with like a lot of data all at the same time uh, and sort of reform their, their questions. And so, uh, you know, we had we had an approach that was, um, uh, you know, build. Uh, so actually, the, the, the second second reason I show this is because uh, we built this kind of a view because we couldn't specify the end-to-end -end system which need to be built. If you, if you can specify it in advance, then you can design and, and software implement this kind of a thing. But when you don't know what it's supposed to do entirely, you have to give yourself a lot of wiggle room between uh, mechanisms and components. And so we did that. We built uh, a lot of prototypes. Uh, we invested over $50 million. Uh, we 
we deployed them into multiple enterprises, you know, as small as 100 users, as many as 5,000 users, as small as 100 million records, as many as 100 billion records. And, and the variance in this space uh, was like quite, quite high, which I'll, I'll explain in just a second. Um, and uh, you know, there are things like terrorist financing and, and cyber fraud and, 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 and terrorism. Uh, but I wanted to kind of you know, sort of spend just a couple of minutes on, on, on the lessons uh, th from what we thought the reality of that, those deployments would be and so what they actually were. And so wh what I thought it was gonna be important was to understand scale and the homogeneity of data. It turns out that like data are federated and random and then hard to get to places in a company. The bigger the company, the more federated places, uh, the more connecting a simple select statement like in SQL becomes a really big problem. And uh, the harder it is to deal with missing information and other kind of corruption. Uh, we thought it was gonna be clean. It turned out that it was like, in the, especially in the military, a lot of like found data and combinations of internal records and external web data. Uh, we thought there was gonna be a kind of single type of user and organization we could model. It turns out there was a distribution of users. Uh, I thought, are there 10 groups? Are there one? For us, it turned out there were two. There was the tech expert who could handle inter uh, sort of interactive software, and then there was the, the domain expert, the, the cop and the doctor and the lawyer. Um, we, I thought it was gonna be an issue about causality. It turned out for most things that I was looking at, there was no machine learning happening at all. Uh, I thought it was gonna be math to answers. It ended up being visualization to interactivity. I thought it was gonna be standalone. It turned out that people were involved all the time at every stage. Uh, I thought uh, it was gonna be as simple as read me in tutorials. It turns out on-site training and, and regular uh, on-site interaction were, were important. And uh, you know, iterating with customers and, and, and business processes were, were some of the most challenging aspects of integrating into large uh, industrial and, and governmental uh, institutions. Okay, and so uh, you know, if we go back to, to, to this thing, as I, as I shift to the, to the demo here in one, one minute, uh, you know, should, should we accept this as a, as a reasonable search strategy for, for anti-human trafficking processes or, or, or anything else, this meandering uh, manual configuration uh, serially? Uh, I think the answer is no, and so, so what I'm gonna propose here, and I would love to hear people's feedback, actually, because this is a special projects research kind of thing, is uh, a, a, new, a new kind of search. Uh, what I'm proposing is to take the lessons of, of these practices and, and our experience and uh, consider something like a, a professionalized search. Uh, where you have um, a different starting point. You know, it, it, so there's the premise that you need a new kind of search, like I've explained, and the premise is it's based around sets of documents. And uh, that's important to differentiate search from professional search because uh, if you start from a collection of documents, it's different than starting from a single search string. The person with the case file with images and subpoena records and data files is different than the person who has the name of the restaurant or the, the thing they wanna buy. Uh, you have to distill aggregated content as opposed to produce facts. You have to uh, enable interactivity as opposed to produce a list of links. And you have a different audience in mind. So th this to me encapsulates the, the process that I was observing in the field and in deploying enterprises again and again and again. This, this process of, of swiveling between screens and browser tabs and manually cutting and pasting search terms and queries and then aggregating those things on, on your own. And I think that with the web, it's a great opportunity for us since we have an index of it uh, to potentially offer a different experience for those that have a document-oriented professional task, right? Okay, and so let me show you what I mean, okay? Um, in terms of all of this, kind of visual analytics, uh, search, uh, interactivity. So um, this, of course, not doing that now. How about I exit presentation mode? I'm also had to upgrade to Windows 10 like yesterday, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, it, was, it wasn't my choice, right? Okay, now what did we do? This was, I swear. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's try. It kicked it into. Um, yeah, yeah, well, when I went into presentation mode, Windows, it's like a, sorry, one second. I will get there right now. Okay, saved. So, so here we're looking at a map. Uh, this map is kind of hard to see. Uh, imagine I'm a person solving an anti-human trafficking case and I wanna know questions like, uh, where, is there, where are the people selling sex that I didn't know about before? So if I start from that viewpoint and I wanna use the web, maybe I need to understand social media. So in this case, we'll look at say uh, half a billion um, Instagram posts over, over a couple of months that are geotagged because most of theirs are. And you see things like uh, communications infrastructure and population, more or less. 
Uh, if we go back to, to, to black, it looks a little bit nicer on my screen, but yeah, a little bit better. Um, and then importantly, if you, if you want to know the sex trade, you look for terms in the industry. And, and this is all you know, interactive tiles, rendering, analytics of information in real time as I'm browsing this. It's like a half a billion points. And uh, you know, if, I, if I zoom in, I can see the heat map of places selling, uh, of people posting about selling sex uh, is much sparser than the heat map of people posting about anything, not surprising. If I want to see then like what kinds of, of terms are being used, we can overlay these things called tile-based uh, tile analytics, where uh, it's a word cloud, and the word cloud is a function of the geography. So here in the southeast United States, there's a word cloud where the larger the word, the more time the post was being used. So escort was being used more than hooker, and you can then kind of, there's a carousel to move between uh, views of, of users or uh, trend lines. And if I zoom into a place maybe that uh, has a term I haven't, haven't seen before, um, if it'll cooperate. Um, all of you are hitting the network, I'm sure. Um, but there's, say, around, uh, around Toronto here, there's this term import model I haven't heard before. So if I drill into it, I can see kind of when that term was used and then the actual posts that are using it. And it turns out this place, Zenful Toronto, was selling sex that we didn't know about before. Um, but even with half a billion data points, you can quickly embed layers that show all the data all the time without having to sample or subset every time. And if I, if I then do something more, more maybe sophisticated, I want to know if someone posts, posts near one of these known locations and they post about uh, selling sex, where else do they post? Because it turns out people often will like, go up the road, like two miles to a, to a hotel uh, with the same people, same, same women, same young boys. Uh, same, you know, diff different problem for labor trafficking, but very important issue also. And so if you zoom out though, uh, you can quickly see that, that around the US there's a few hundred known locations. And uh, if it'll draw for me, um, these blue dots that we have maybe identified as, as uh, you know, sort of known. And then uh, you can see it's all over the world, right? So, so as, a, as a person with just my mouse like dragging around, I'm asking complicated questions about the use of terms, the geography, the movement, uh, global issues, uh, with lots of data at scale interactively. So it changes my job than if I'm doing this in a different way. It's a different kind of job. OK, same, same concept, completely different form. If we take as a proxy for um, uh, sort of offline data, uh, email, it's a great example because it has all kinds of file types and um, you know, corporate information kinds of things. Uh, conveniently, Jeb Bush released his email uh, publicly a couple of months ago. And uh, if you were to draw the, the connections graph of, of people he sends email with over a couple of days, here's a graph. Every node is a person, if they're connected, that were on the to, from, or CC line. Here's a ranked list of people that were important to him based on how fast they respond to his email. But now what I'll do is show you with these kinds of interfaces how quickly you can ask lots of complicated questions. So if I'm interested in this person, I can quickly then grab the subset of the graph that deals with that person. They're highlighted there. This is Jeb. If I want to look at the emails, I can see them here. Here's one of them. Already terms are extracted. So if Orlando, I'm not sure what's happening in Orlando. I can see the subset of, of emails around Orlando. Uh, if I'm interested in the topic, I can see this is about sort of like work issues. And, and then, you know, Im importantly, I can go back and forth between like global views, connected views, uh, faceted views. And, and also, we, I found that people are like super lazy. So maybe I'm, I'm writing an article about him, and I'm, I'm curious about in his email, uh, does he talk about his brother at all? So I can just go to like maybe Wikipedia, and I can grab just the entire, entire top of the page. And if I go back and, and sort of paste this entire thing in uh, as, a, as a complex query, uh, what'll happen is it'll immediately parse it. All of the uh, terms are terms that are extracted entities and are connected back to our, our original data. So if I'm curious about how often in the email uh, Jeb talks about Congress because that was in my snippet, you know, here's a way to do it. And, and so you know, what, I, what I'm enabling really is nothing, nothing revolutionary other than uh, the technologies to build the components of these things have become mature in the last three years. Extracting entities from text, images, video, and speech uh, and lightweight, interactive, uh, this is like D3-based, the other one was JavaScript-based. Uh, these are now component-wise mature enough to the extent that you can build this kind of interactive thing in, in, in a few weeks uh, with a few people uh, without PhDs, uh, as opposed to you know, a few years ago, it's quite, quite harder. 
Um, and so if we want to take this idea to the next level, like one, one thing we may want to do is understand the relationship between my offline collection of documents, my uh, snippet of a complicated query, and then the web results, right? Wouldn't it be nice for the internet to tell me that in fact these two uh, people are related? Uh, maybe I didn't observe their relationship in my email, but maybe they're related online because they are on a web page together. And so if I take this kind of a concept, uh, you know, what, what you can see are, you know, the graphs become very big. This is a, a, a graph using this kind of a, of, a, of a, you know, three documents and then all of the entities that are extracted from those documents. And then if I have something like a snippet, like I was doing here before, where I want to copy and paste those, I get a different kind of a graph where I have a snippet that's joined against some of the entities and some of the documents. And then if I want to use all of this, the entire thing, as a complex query to the internet, internet, tell me things that are related I didn't know, or people that should be on this graph that are not, uh, it can then return um, sort of graphs that are even sort of more big and, and, and sort of join-oriented, right? And so I guess what I'm trying to argue, a couple of things, you know, one is that um, we work in this space of complex data objects regularly now, and if we can enable users to do simple actions with complex objects, uh, they will be empowered to do new kinds of work. They'll have a new kind of job. And importantly, the components necessary to build these kinds of systems are competitive in the open source space. And so it becomes a bigger question of like, where is the value? Is the value in your data? Is it in the algorithm? Is it in your implementation? Is it in the maintenance and hosting of it? Uh, these kinds of questions, right? Those are the more important kinds of questions to really noodle on, I think, rather than uh, sort of chasing the decimal point in your uh, classification error metric, right? So, um, you know, if I were to uh, go back here and see if this works now to our dog. Um, you know, if I were to say, uh, you know, actually, let me just first say, just say thank you, because I'm running out of time. Um, I'll leave this up here as I finish. So, so kind of in summary, uh, my my points are that uh, this notion of, of field testing with real users, of interacting with uh, real enterprises, of, of compiling components, of a focus around system integration and testing, and around the enabling of people to do uh, sort of iterative analytical development as, as a kind of paradigm for uh, testing the, the value proposition of, of machine learning and related work. That's a very important point because I found that it was very hard to tell whether two competing algorithms were more important without embedding them into the intent application. And what I found is that the applications that are more common these days are those involving the collection of documents and the integration of components and concepts between them. So I think that these, these kinds of topics are, are, are really important because to me, um, you know, as someone that was driving research design, uh, picking problems to work on is, is maybe the most important thing to do. Right, and so if you're not picking problems with the context of people coming out of big tech companies or big government investments or uh, small startup companies that have succeeded, uh, then your aperture is quite narrow based on uh, your peers' uh, evaluation of the merit of your work through you know, publications. Uh, I would argue that these kinds of lessons that I'm trying to explain here uh, should affect uh, the decisions you make about which problems to work on. Uh, because this is the space where things are moving the quickest and where the companies are having the biggest valuations uh, and you know where a lot of the really interesting work is happening in my, my opinion. So maybe I'll just end, end there for now. Yep. Any questions? We have time for a few questions uh, and I believe we have a mic. Go ahead. Why don't you start uh, saying the question while the mic comes? So, so what happens if you drop the potential document in two? Is there some magic that can? Yeah. So, so actually, amazing. I did this like a couple of weeks ago. I, I, I'm obsessed with simple user actions that are complex queries, right? So I cut and pasted a whole document into Google and Bing and Yahoo, and it's the first time I've ever crashed Google in my entire life. <laughs> yeah, because you get a four or four error out of Google, I like I want to frame it. Right. Uh, with, with Bing, it's even worse because they only process the first sentence, but they pretend like they process all of it. So that's even like a, it was a sneakier error, right? 
Uh, and you know, s same with these notions of like drag and drop, right? Like, like I'm never, I'm never in a vacuum when I'm, when I'm querying, right? I have like not just usually a page. I usually have like a full document, and I want to know like in the document how many terms are relevant to to be like you know queryable, and then how they're related to each other, and how they're related to other documents that are that are online. And so these these kinds of uh, cut and paste, I think, are just simple, understandable things, but they they highlight the power of of uh, latent spaces that can be induced through extraction methods on text, Im image, video, speech. Uh, they highlight uh, complex join spaces between, uh, say, semantic spaces or term spaces or metadata spaces. And, and they highlight interactivity, because now that you've done this cut and paste, you, you know, think of it like the difference between when you're like, reading and you're driving the pace of how fast you're reading versus like watching TV and you're like, holding onto the chair. It's kind of like coming at you. Right now in search, we're kind of like in this sort of reading space. Uh, mostly, and this sort of like sitting back and, and like dictating, you know, curating is, is sort of where, where it probably needs to move to. Uh, another analogy I draw is like uh, Microsoft Office is a great sort of microscope. You can like open documents and you can view the insides of them, text, terms, and numbers, right? Uh, but there aren't very many tools that are working across documents, and especially those that touch search. And so this kind of frame of reference around documents and, and search as a complex task is is what I think, you know, I feel the frustration and I've observed in, in a lot of others. Uh, I think we can address it with modern techniques. Cool, thank you. Yeah, yeah we have a question here. Congratulations for this work. Um, how are you planning to deal with the, all the junk that we have in the internet? internet? Uh, yeah, the, so there's a lot of junk on the internet. The internet's a lot bigger than most people think, obviously, with like deep web and dark web things, uh, not to mention bots and spam and uh, you know, there's there's just sort of no ignoring it. Uh, sort of George's talk earlier, he kind of like elided it, uh, but there's no getting around people gaming systems uh, and the need uh, to understand where that's hurting you. I would argue that in the professional space, uh, much like maybe you go to Google Docs to do your weekend planning, but when you do work office products, you use like Microsoft Office. Most people do, right? There, there's a, there's a notion of for. for you know, personal tasks, maybe you're okay with navigating spam and navigating uh, ads that are posted to you, you'll wait, you know. But for professional tasks, and maybe you're willing to uh, pay for a slightly different experience where someone, like a company, takes care of that for you, right? And this is one of the big questions, right, is like the viability of paying for things. And, and what, you know, the, one of the talks earlier talked about how software, hardware is being replaced by software, software by data maybe, and inf data by intelligence, something like this. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, but it's definitely the case that people don't like paying for stuff, uh, especially for content on the internet. And so to know the circumstances in which information is valuable enough or the process that you're enabling is valuable enough for people to pay for, that's where the, I think, research testing comes in. We have time for one more question. Yeah, right there. Thank you. When I see people trying to research uh, in the way you were shown, question comes to mind, how, how do you keep a notebook of that and then show it to someone else? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Uh, the program that, that we just mentioned I ran before, I called uh, Mimex. And that was actually a throwback to Venevar Bush's 1945 article called As We May Think. And he envisioned this machine uh, that was a, like a table that would have spools of microfiche that as you did your research, you would tag elements that would create a trail and the most important part of that was that you could share your trail with other people. Uh, it led to sort of anticipated hyperlinks on Wikipedia and a bunch of other amazing things. But that particular aspect remains to be a, a hard problem. Uh, like we have cookies and we have session logs, but there really isn't a great, other than like IPython notebooks, Jupyter notebooks, and MATLAB workspaces, there's not really easy and good mechanisms for sharing uh, complex work tasks. Uh, but I think that, that given this move to the cloud and given the advancement in thin client architectures like uh, WebGL, D3, Canvas kinds of things, uh, you're able to log a lot more than you could before, and you're able to expose that to other users. So the things that I'm doing, you know, where I'm, where I'm we call this like the, the data wake, actually. Like when you're, when, you're, when you're creating a trail through all this content, there's this like wake of, of peripheral information where if you had had more time or had been better, you might have reviewed it, but you didn't, and so it's lost. But that whole thing you'd like to share, not just even what you did, but maybe the things you could have done if you had been better. And so the representational form to do that has to involve some of these kinds of ideas, has to involve complex data structures, things like graphs, things like joins, things like uh, authentication and sharing. 
Uh, I think this is a start to it, but I would imagine that a professional search task, the collaboration would be an important component to it. And the need to uh, differentiate quality of users, for example, uh, or quality of the tools they're using uh, are, are both important ones. I think that's not a great answer, but it's an important part of it. OK, one last, yeah. for sure. on the last point in your response, right? I think one thing that seems not to have been identified very well is you might call it a business process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you think of this whole interactive process, mm -hmm. many tasks actually have a process embedded in it, mm -hmm. which in the interaction you can infer or learn. Mm -hmm. And you might need some sort of sliver of human intelligence for semi-supervised learning. Right, right. And that might help you attain the metadata type of thing, which goes back to mm -hmm. Memex, I think. And mm -hmm. that might be a possible solution. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, you know, business process is like a dirty word for people that deal with them all the time. I didn't even know what it meant until a couple of years ago. Usually it means pain and like uh, detritus and like it was a solution to someone else's problem and now it's your problem kind of thing, right? Uh, but it turns out that uh, there has to be some chicken and egg. Like business processes don't change unless there's a good reason for them. But technology often can't be built unless it can suit a business process. And so as part of why, you know, some of the things that, that, that Usama and, and, and Basil are mentioning about things like Barclays is really valuable, that if you have an environment that lets you test uh, these kinds of things to know where the annotation is needed or where the feedback is needed and to do it cheaply and quickly, uh, all of a sudden then when you have the business process discussion, you say, whoa, look at all this amazing thing we could do with like some duct tape, right? Imagine with a team what we could do with it. Cool. Cool. Let us thank Great. Chris once again.